I'm Myrna Weisman, and today I'm going to talk about three years of studying families at risk for depression, what have we learned, and how that relates to humanitarian work. I wish that I could talk to you in person. I wish that we could exchange questions, that we could shake hands and even hug, and hopefully next year we're going to be able to do that. So this is my presentation today. I'm going to give you a brief summary of my research on families at risk for depression, and I'm going to show how this relates to some of the humanitarian work that I've done that have won me this wonderful prize in honor of Dr. Pardis. I'm also going to show you and illustrate that this work, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, supported the early research showing that the studies could be done because when we started, it was not clear it could be done. It also continues to support our young investigators who have novel ideas for understanding the biological mechanisms and the treatments for these disorders. Well, let me tell you how it was when I started out of graduate school in the 70s. The question was, <clears throat> does childhood depression exist? Can you imagine that? In fact, the conventional wisdom held that major depression was a disorder primarily of middle-aged and menopausal women, and it didn't happen in children. They didn't have sufficient ego development. And in fact, this prestigious committee that met and summarized their work in Psychological Bulletin in 1978 said, the notion of a syndrome of childhood depression rests largely on surmise. Well, then data came. And in the 80s, in the early 80s, the first epidemiologic studies of psychiatric disorders were done in the United States. And this one is a later one, but it summarizes what we found. And this is based on almost 8,000 people, a probability sample of the United States. And if you look at the bottom, which is the age of onset of depression, you can see that depression before puberty is uncommon. It begins to rise between around the ages of 11 and 15. And for any of you who have teenagers, you know, around age 16 and older, the first onsets of depression, depressive symptoms begin to rise. They become highest at that point. And then they gradually decline. And in fact, the notion of a uh, menopausal depression first occurring in menopause is one that uh, I think we can say has been disputed. Well, it was these kind of data that got me interested in starting the research for my research career. Because I was interested in how to understand the early onsets of depression, understand depression as before it began, or at least the very early symptoms, because that's when you want to intervene in order to be able to have a prevention, an intervention that will help so that you don't have the morbidity, morbidity of these illnesses later. In other words, we don't want the teenagers to screw up their lives with depression when they're making important decisions. So I began this study. I started with generation one, that's the parents, and I took those who had serious depression. And then I matched them to a group, a low-risk family, and these came from the same community actually the same community that where these epidemiologic studies were done. And this was somebody selected who had no evidence of major depression or other major psychiatric disorders, and we interviewed them several times. From then on, it was, uh, it was easy what you would do. We studied all the children, their offspring, that's the second generation. And as you can see, as time goes on, they get married, and then they have children and we studied the third generation, and that's the grandchildren. And we did the same studies in the high-risk and in the low-risk families, and when we interviewed them, the interviewer didn't know which families they came from. Well, I'm not going to give you 30 years of studies and, and findings, but I will summarize it here. And this is what we found at every wave that we interviewed them, and this was the last one that we have a slide on, we're actually looking now at the 40 year. And as you can see, the blue are the high risk offspring. And they have higher rates of depression as compared to the low risk offspring. 
They have higher risk rates of anxiety disorders. They have higher rates of substance abuse. And we didn't find, I think we found one case of schizophrenia. We found no bipolar illness. And we didn't find other major illnesses. And this is what's been clear throughout, that an offspring who has a parent who's depressed has a much higher rate of having depression as over the lifespan. This is another and a somewhat upsetting finding, and this has to do with mortality. And as you can see, the mortality rates were much higher in the offspring of the high-risk families. And this was largely accounted for by unnatural causes, and that was accidents, suicides, and overdoses. And when we weren't sure whether an overdose was a suicide, we just called it an overdose. We've actually looked at this now, eight years later from this slide, and the rates of deaths from unnatural causes has gone up to almost 5%. And in the low risk, we don't find any. Well, as you saw, we have grandchildren. What happened to the grandchildren? And here the news is a lot better. And the, the, the risk becomes attenuated. As you can see, if the offspring is from a high-risk family, that's the grandparents, and there are two generations affected, that is their parents and the grandparents had depression. The grandchild's probability of depression is very high, the right bar on the right-hand side. However, for the other groups, they're about the same. So that's good news. Things improve over time. Well, about halfway through the study, we decided, what should we do? I mean, we can't just study people but we ought to try to do an intervention. We ought to see whether we can uh, help people because we knew that having a depressed parent, and it isn't just a mother, it's a mother or a father, um, is, is a, creates morbidity in, in the children. So we designed a study and we hooked on actually to another study. And we asked the question, if you could treat the depressed mother, would this help the child? And we did this study, treating the mother with medication. And in fact, we've done two studies now with different medications. And a group in Pittsburgh has done a similar study using psychotherapy. But as you can see, if the mother remitted at three months, the children got better. If the mother didn't remit, the children didn't get better. In fact, they got slightly worse. We followed these children over a year. And even if the mother had a late remission, we saw the same effect. So that's hopeful. If you can treat the depressed parent and have them successfully remove their symptoms, the children seem to improve as well. And it doesn't matter whether it's drugs or if it's psychotherapy. And this summarizes, successfully treating the parent helps the child. If the mother's depression remits with treatment, the child improved. Now, of course, the mother's depression could remit Without treatment, then that would be good too, but treatment accelerates that. But it, and it doesn't matter if the mother received medication or psychotherapy. If she improves, so did her child. We thought that was a very important finding. So now we have a nice body of research which establishes the basis for humanitarian work. We show that depression begins early in life. Now, much of these findings you now take for granted, but when we started, these were not taken for granted. Depression begins early in life, around adolescence. It recurs and appear, impairs to over a lifetime. I haven't showed you all those slides. It runs in families, and it's treatable. The humanitarian work then had these data available to provide early evidence-based and affordable treatment. So, and all of this work sort of occurs concurrently when opportunities arise. And, and I'm going to talk about interpersonal psychotherapy because I had a hand in developing that. But it isn't just interpersonal psychotherapy. It's any evidence-based psychotherapy and medication and often sometimes combined that will help the depression. But this is where I did my humanitarian work. In 2000. And one, I think it was, we were asked to try to help people 
in Uganda. They had very high rates of depression. The local healers could not help them. And uh, they had tried just about everything. They had, had civil wars, they had had famine, they had had many, many problems. And they were able to solve a lot of them, but depression they couldn't solve. So we designed a study because we didn't want to just hand out uh, patent medicine. We wanted to make sure something would work. And we had to use psychotherapy because doctors, medical doctors were not available and psychotherapy was what they felt was needed. So we designed a study and we tested a group IPT in, uh, I think it was 155 people. And we, of course, compared it to no treatment or whatever was available treatment. And with the idea that at the end of the study, if our treatment worked, we would provide the treatment to those who were in the control group. Well, I haven't showed you the slides of the study. I must say the findings were very strong and they showed that IPT in a group format helped reduce symptoms of depression. And about uh, five months after the study was published, this article appeared in the New York Times. And it says, group therapy helped ease the burden of AIDS in Uganda. Well, I was interested in this and wondered somebody else was doing some other treatment and uh, was helping AIDS. And I thought that was very interesting. So we began to pursue what was this about? Well, it turned out that our, study, our findings were so spectacular that nobody believed them. And a group of investigative reporters went to Uganda and interviewed um, I guess some of the people we trained, and they also interviewed some of the patients, and they, they didn't call it IPT, but they published this, that group therapy helped ease the burden of AIDS in Uganda. We weren't looking at AIDS, we were looking at depression, but we were really pleased that our findings held out when they were scrutinized. Now, <clears throat> we had promised people that we would treat them if the treatment worked, and we set about doing it, but we were, um, we didn't have to do that. Sean Mabry developed this humanitarian organization called Strong Mind. He was a former diplomat and was looking to do something uh, good, something humanitarian. And he contacted us and he started offering, and he took the people we had trained and he started offering IPT in a group uh, to people in Kamala, Uganda. Well, this one has gone on for a number of years now, this was 2018, he had treated over 5,000 women while well, he has treated many more uh, since then. And with COVID, he has developed apps and there's treat he's treating them over the telephone. So it is a strong organization, it has won a number of awards. And by Forbes magazine, it was called one of the uh, five organizations that it's important to support. So. I congratulate Sean, and I'm delighted to be involved in this work in some way. The World Health Organization was also interested in this work, and they asked us to adapt the manual, because if you're going to do evidence-based psychotherapy, you have to write down what you're doing so that you can train people. It isn't just you say, we support people. You say what you say and how you do it. So uh, myself with a group of others, we uh, developed the manual in uh, more detail. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, put it in this pretty book and they now, uh, they use it. It's one of the recommended treatments and these manuals are freely translated and distributed by the World Health Organization and we're really proud of that. And later I'll show you how to get these if you want. So they were formed an international society of IPT. Uh, pe people got very interested in training. Um, it's all run on a shoestring, but it's, uh, it's, as you can see, it's global. And this shows you as of last year, when I made this map, uh, where IPT is being taught and where it's being used. Well, there's one other part of this research and also humanitarian effort. I showed you this slide in the beginning, which showed that depression begins early in the teens. And if you help the mother, you can help the child. So we started thinking, what about pregnancy? Shouldn't we 
start treating depressed mothers during pregnancy? And shouldn't we treat them early and rigorously to remission? And if we treated them early and vigorously to remission, we would perhaps prevent their depression and the early effects on the offspring. Well, we, we worked in a series of studies with many others in which we tried out uh, use of medication during, we, we looked at the effects of medication on, uh, on the fetus and these were a, bunch, a number of, uh, of long-term studies which showed that if you can avoid medication during pregnancy, and sometimes you can, that it's really, it's good to use psychotherapy. Well, in 2019, and we, we published these findings, we reported them at meetings, and what we stressed is that if you can provide an evidence-based psychotherapy for depression during pregnancy, it's probably a very good idea for both the mother and the infant. In 2019, that's just last February, the U.S. Preventive Task Force released new recommendations. And we had nothing to do with this, um, but we certainly would have supported it. Physicians should screen pregnant women and new moms to identify those at risk for becoming depressed so they can be treated before they show symptoms. And in their report that had occurred about four or five years before they said there were no psychotherapies, or nothing, nothing much was available, so you might as well use medication. And in this one, the new recommendation, they reviewed the existing studies and they recommended cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy to prevent depression in at-risk women. And this was published in JAMA uh, in February 2019, uh, which is a very respectable medical journal. Now, hopefully, there are other evidence-based psychotherapies that are being tested. Hopefully, these can be done by community health workers so it's more available. Uh, but we're glad that it's taking this direction to make affordable psychotherapies available early before even the child is born. Well, we have a whole new set of experiences, the U.S. 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased the need for early evidence-based affordable treatment. And the Zoom is a Zooming back and forth from all over the world. Psychotherapy manuals are being simplified. Community health workers, those are sometimes people who've had a high school education, are being trained. And self-guided and computerized versions are being developed. And there's a lot more. And uh, we're involved in whatever we're asked to be involved in, because it's an important effort for, uh, for the population, especially now since the rates of depression are skyrocketing. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine issued this report uh, just a few months ago. It's on fostering the health, mental health, emotional and behavioral development in children and youth. I was involved in this, uh, in this project it was a consensus study report. There were many people from all over the country of many different disciplines, and they recommend the early treatment of youth, the treatment of pregnant women, and they recommend use of community health workers. So I've just given you a snapshot. I want to thank you, Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Your support has provided a research basis for the humanitarian efforts. If you want any of these free manuals, please contact me. I'm, uh, I'm on the computer. You can surely find it, and this is the address. And now, this is the hardest slide I had to make. Can you believe it? We could not find one slide that had these four heroes in it all together. Probably each one is taking pictures of the other. So. I have Jeff, I have Steve, I have Herb, and I have Connie. And my husband very nicely photoshot Connie into it because that was the one picture we found with at least three. And we found another so that we can get Connie. We love these people. They have done so much for science. And that science has filtered into humanitarian work. 
all I can say is support brain and behavior. It means a great deal to you and to the coming generations of scientists who will have even better and more novel findings that will help your mental health. Thank you.